All right, joining me in the passenger seat today is John Godfrey, former minister of infrastructure and communities. Hello, John. When I was minister uh, and a member of parliament at the same time, Paul Martin, who was the prime minister of the day, gave me a mandate. He wanted a new deal for Canadian cities. And what that new deal meant was that the federal government should work with municipalities and with the provinces to come up with a long-term vision of where we wanted Canadian cities to be in 25 or 30 years. I think the primary uh, obstacle to reducing congestion is a lack of readily available public transit. And, um, and I think I put that over and above bike lanes, which are fine, but it's really public transit which matters. You can never outbuild or, 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 or build your way out of the, the congestion problem. Uh, the moment you open up another lane, uh, it fills the next day and people get out of the buses back into their cars. So the answer to congestion is more congestion. You actually want total gridlock. It's really an excellent thing for a city to have gridlock because provided that there's an alternative <laughs> and that alternative has to be public transit or it has to be dedicated tran uh, uh, lanes on the highway for high occupancy vehicles or for commercial vehicles. But you can never build your way out of congestion or gridlock. Forget it. So you're saying just lock it down and give them another option? That's right, but you have to build the option first. You can't just have gridlock and no option. I mean, that's the worst of all worlds. So, so uh, the most successful cities in the world are measured by the visibility of two things. One is trees, and the other is you can always see a bus or a streetcar or something going by, that you're just constantly aware that there's an easy alternative that to get you downtown. If you don't have affordable housing uh, close to public transit, then the inescapable logic is that you force people out to Maple or Richmond Hill or some other place and then you force them to drive to work because they can't afford to live in the city. And so if, if to, to overcome that you have to have a very different view of how you're going to have community development and you can't build suburbs unless you start with public transit. We've got it all backwards. But we've got to find a different way of framing the discussion. For example, if you ask people, do you want to live in a denser neighborhood, you tend to get a negative reaction. If you ask them, do you want to live in a more walkable neighborhood where you can take walk your kids to school, where they can play with their friends, where you have, you, you, if you're an old person, you don't have to get in a car and drive to the convenience store, you can actually walk it. If you, if you reframe the debate, how do you want to live your life? Uh, you will still have to overcome the prejudice towards uh, single-family dwellings on large lots that are only you can only get to by driving. But more and more people on their own are discovering the value and virtue of living in a, an urban environment where, where young kids can jump on that bus over there and they, they're not limited by their driver's license and they have greater freedom. So it's, it's all about reframing the questions and, and a greater emphasis on public transit, then? But yeah, and as well as walking and, and biking. I don't want to minimize it, but tra public transit is going to make the, the greatest impact on, on our lives. All right, well, thank you very much for talking to me. Good fun talking to you too, Tanner. <laughs>